Hi guys and welcome to this third part of our coverage on the Sicilian defense and uh, this time around we're going to be examining the position that we have here on the board. White has played the pawn move to e4, black has played pawn to c5, white has then developed the knight to f3 and finally black plays the pawn move to e6. In the previous two parts we looked at the pawn move to d6 and the knight move to c6. In the case of this pawn move to e6, it's a very reasonable move. Black, in some situations, threatens to play d5. And, well, white has different options like c3 or b3 or even g3. But the most principled way of playing here is pawn to d4, uh, grabbing space in the center. Black then captures the pawn and white plays knight takes d4. And here, black has a variety of options. The first one that we can look at is the move knight to f6. Now, this move, it's a little bit of a tricky move, and it's a good one to play against maybe weaker opponents, because some of the time they will push the pawn to e5, and here black actually would have the move queen a5 check. So if you're playing the Sicilian as black, then this is a very good trick to watch out for. If not, uh, if you're white, then of course you should be equally careful, equally on guard that you don't push the pawn to e5. Here white would instead defend the pawn with the move knight to c3. Now, in this position here, we have two possibilities. Black can either develop his other knight with the move knight to c6, or he can play the move bishop to b4. The move bishop to b4 is known as the pin variation and is considered to be a little bit dubious. In this case, white actually can continue to play e5 if he wishes, but the positions can get extremely messy here. Black, for example, could play moves like knight to e4, and white can respond with queen g4, striking at the pawn on g7, striking at the knight on e4, but leaving his knight here on c3 uh, hanging. So you can imagine that the pin variation of the Sicilian defense while it's a very rare guess at the master level, because master level players have sort of worked out what the best options are, um, at the club level this is quite a tricky move because white's pawn is under fire and if white doesn't know how to react properly, if he doesn't know ideas like queen g4, the lines get very messy and uh, the white player can get very scared. Uh, for example, another possible reaction here by a unprepared white player might be to say, well, my knight is under attack, I want to make sure that the pawn on e4 is safe, so I'll play the move pawn to f3. And now if black continues with d5, we can see that that two versus one majority in the Sicilian defense can already be very useful here for black when he um, already has a very nice situation. And if white captures the pawn on d5, then this pawn move on f3 will just have weakened white while black can bring his pieces into the attack. So the pin variation, a rare guest at the master level, but a very tricky and dangerous guest at the club level and one to definitely know uh, if you are playing against the Sicilian on a regular basis. Let's see what other options there are. If after the moves knight f6 and knight to c3, black decides not to play the a pin variation of the Sicilian, black sometimes brings his knight out to c6. We've seen that in a lot of Sicilians, black likes to put the pawn on a6 and control the b5 square. But here, notice that because the knight is already on, b on c3, white can actually play the pawn move e5 and harass the black knight. Black usually likes to try and avoid such a move, so he could play uh, d6 and go for a Scheveningen setup, but we have already covered the Scheveningen in a different uh, video, so for now we will look at only this move knight to c6, which is um, a new move, a new idea, but with a bit of an old twist. What do I mean by this? Well, if white puts the knight on b5, which he very often does, then after d6, covering the d6 square, White goes bishop to f4, striking at d6, and after the pawn move to e5, 
some of you will realize that we have now arrived, those of you who watched the previous part, may realize that we've arrived at a so-called Sveshnikov variation. However, White doesn't have to just go back into the Sveshnikov. We've seen, by the way, in, in just in the last couple of minutes, we've referenced the Scheveningen variation, we've referenced the Sveshnikov, which were covered in previous videos, and this goes to show that there are actually many possibilities to switch up the move order and basically reach the same position, but in a different way. Here, uh, the final move to consider is if white captures here knight takes c6, when we would stay in the so-called four knights variation of the Sicilian, the exchange variation. Black captures, and one thing that we notice is black is building up his central pawn mass here, but now that there is no check on a5, white can play e5, with this pawn still backwards and all the pawns on light squares, the dark squares in this variation can be quite weak for black. Black usually puts his knight in the center and white drives his knight to e4 to try to punish this dark square here on d6 and this leads to very sharp and complicated play. This is in the four knights exchange. Okay, so what more possibilities are there? Let's take a look at the next one. So, we've just taken a look at what happens after black's move knight to f6, but now we're going to focus on the other two major options that black has to round up our coverage of the Sicilian defense. The next option is the move pawn to a6. This is the so-called Khan variation. It's named after Ilya Khan. So what's the idea behind playing this move pawn to a6? Well, black simply prevents all of these ideas that we saw with knight to b5 in the Sveshnikov and in the Kalashnikov, other um, openings where black leaves this hole, having played e6 or e5, creates a weakness on d6, and the white knight can very often exploit this square. So with a6, black stops all of these ideas. However, it does give white time, and in the Sicilian, as we saw in previous videos, when the knight has not gone to c3, white can play c4, setting up once again the Maroxy bind, grabbing space and really seizing control of the d5 uh, point. So this is one of the possible ways in which white can meet this move. The other popular uh, way for white to continue is to simply develop his bishop. Usually he places it to d3 to support his pawn and in the future an advance may make the bishop very active. It makes more sense here than on c4 when black's structure makes the bishop a very ineffective piece. The bishop comes to d3, black usually hits the knight uh, with bishop to c5, and after knight b3, black has a choice of either keeping the bishop on this long diagonal, which may leave him a little bit vulnerable to early attacks by white on the king's side, or black can retreat the bishop a little bit more passively but the bishop is closer to the king's side, and so he is a little bit safer. This is, these are the two major possibilities. Finally, in this position, white can also play with the move knight to c3, and black here, as is very typical in many Sicilian defenses, will place his queen on c7, from where the queen is both on the semi-open c-file and also on the long diagonal from h2 to b8. Black sometimes can even develop his bishop to d6 and form a battery against the castled white king. Other times black may put his bishop on b4 and put pressure on this knight on c3. There are many different plans that black can follow. We can't see them all, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of a feel for this not so popular variation at the club level, the so-called Sicilian can. The last variation that we're going to show is the Paulson. In this position, we just took a look at the move a6, which marks the beginning of the Sicilian Khan. However, black can also develop his queen's knight to c6 without uh, worrying to control the b5 square. After this move, white usually continues his development with knight c3, 
and black still refrains from playing the move a6 for now, instead planting the queen on c7. White, by the way, does not actually have to play in this way. White can actually, before moving the knight, the knight to c3, aim to put the pawn on c4, or white can also play for the exploitation of the d6 square with knight b5. These ideas, Maroxy bind structures, and knight b5 that reminds one of positions like the Kalashnikov or the Sveshnikov, and indeed sometimes can transpose the Kalashnikov or Sveshnikov, should be by now somewhat familiar to us. If, on the other hand, white continues with the move knight to c3, most common is for black to place his queen on c7, for now remaining flexible with what to do with his king's pieces, and also improving his control of the e5 square. The queen on c7 makes a lot of sense because the queen here is on a very long diagonal from h2 to b8 and is also on the semi-open c file that black possesses. As for what uh, white does from here, he usually continues his development with bishop to e3, supporting his center and preparing the very typical uh, idea of clearing the path for queenside castling. After bishop to e3, Black finally decides to control the b5 square, and at this point we've actually reached a particular, um, let's say, descendant of the Paulson, meaning that once we get a Paulson position, we don't always end up in a Taimanov, but we can, and very often do, reach a Taimanov variation. So here what we have is indeed uh, the opening named after the strong grandmaster Mark Taimanov. Now, after the move a6, white usually plays queen to d2, again continuing his operation on the queen side, and black finally plays knight f6. One of the nice things of having the queen here on c7 is that even if this knight were to disappear, let's imagine knight takes c6 and d takes c6, we see that the queen's control over the e5 square means that white cannot hammer away at the dark squares like he often can in other variations such as the four knights, uh, by advancing on e5. The black queen's control is very helpful. Most of the time here, white actually at the master level castles. And this is one of the reasons why this way of setting up as black can actually be a very powerful way to play against club players. Because many club players will start to very, very seriously worry about the move bishop to b4, pinning this knight here on c3. However, master level players know that this is not really a big deal. It is the main move in the Taimanov, but white can simply combat it with f3. And uh, white is not really worried by either the pawn advance d5, which looks very tempting, since after e takes d5, black would be able to take knight takes d5, when knight takes knight is not an option because the queen falls with check. However, at the more advanced levels, white understands that this kind of d5 move is a little bit premature because after, let's say, the move pawn to a3, if black captures the knight on c3, captures on c3, and goes for the win of a pawn on e4, he may regret his decision to give up this very important dark squared bishop because of the way in which he has set up his pawns. A lot of his pawns are on light squares, and this guy, the defender of the dark squared bishops, is actually a hugely important piece. So really, one of the things to keep in mind about Taimanov positions is that even though black pins the knight with his bishop, most of the time black doesn't actually follow through on this threat. It's more of a bluff than anything else, and it's more really to inconvenience white with the pin. So the threat is in this case certainly stronger than the execution, and most of the time black actually plays with moves like knight e5 to try and generate play on the c file, eventually pushing the pawn on b5, and actually dropping back this bishop to e7 later on. For white's part, he can do the usual advance on the king side, and also he can try to attack this knight and advance on the center and grab a little bit more space using the fact that he already has more space from the beginning. So that's the Paulson and more specifically the Taimanov. We've also examined the Khan, 
there have been a few different Sicilians examined. These are some of the rarer options at the club level, but they're extremely popular at the master level. And certainly um, they're worth experimenting with black and they're worth knowing about with white. This concludes our three-part series on uh, the Sicilian with the focus being on the open Sicilian. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this video and indeed the series of videos. Please give us a like uh, if you have enjoyed the videos. Subscribe for more content if you'd like to see more of the same. And of course, if you want a more in-depth look at videos in a similar style but longer format and more specific and more specialized and also catering to a broader range of levels, then come check us out at chessfactor.com where you'll see videos from me, Alex Astane, but also from many different international masters and grandmasters and uh, chess experts across all the different parts of the game. So hope to see you there.